This is what's so often overlooked. Science is built on philosophy. You can't do science without it. First of all, science is a search for causes, very loosely defined. You're looking what caused a particular effect. In order to do science, you presuppose logic, right? Because you can't do science without logic. You can't do science without the law of causality. Can you prove the law of causality by doing an experiment? No, you have to assume the law of causality in order to do the experiment. Uh, forensics. What's forensics? Forensics are trying to look at past singularities, past events. When somebody, like for example, you're looking who, who killed Ron Simpson and uh, Nicole Brown, the O.J. Simpson trial. You can't go back in time and recreate, bring them back to life. Uh, all you can do is look at clues. And when we're looking for the origin of a murder, or you're looking at the origin of life or the origin of the universe, you're looking at clues. You're looking at the past for clues. That is philosophy in order to do science. Realism, what's realism? The idea that your senses tell you an objective truth about the objective world. Can you prove that by doing an experiment? No, you have to assume that in order to do the experiment. That's why when Hawking says there is no model independent reality, you go, what? There's no objective reality? Then you can't do science. Because that's what you're looking for in science. You're looking to understand objective reality. And ethics, you cannot put honesty in a test tube. What happens if the scientists are unethical? Many say the global warming thing points to people who were dishonest, that they weren't reporting the data honestly, and they were hiding evidence that countered the global warming hysteria. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I haven't studied it enough, but many people are saying those emails are pretty damning. The point is, is that ethics undergird science. So before you're doing, you're doing philosophy, before you do an experiment, you're doing philosophy to determine the rules of science. During you're doing philosophy, every these, all these things undergird it, and after you're doing philosophy, because all data needs to be interpreted. I'll give you one quick example. How many times have you heard evolutionists say that since we have a common genetic code, that were ancestrally related, right? We all have DNA. This is what Dawkins says. This is his main argument for macroevolution. That's certainly possible. But what's the other possibility? Does a common genetic code, remember here, here, here's our data over here. We have a common genetic code. How do we interpret the data? Is it a common ancestor or is it a common designer? How do you know? You don't know. You have to draw, you have to make a, an interpretation. In fact, let me just show you this real quickly because this is very interesting. Do you see this right here? This is a, a series of Corvettes from 1953 to 1978. There was a Darwinist biologist by the name of Tim Barra who offered the progression of the Corvette as evidence of descent with modification. Okay, look at the common design here. That, mo that shows that this is an analogy for evolution, OK? What's the problem with this analogy? Can anyone see it? Huh? How do you interpret the data here? What's the problem with it? What's that? It's, you got a designer. In other words, it's, this is now known as Bear's blunder because this is evidence of intelligent design. You've got a designer designing these things. These things didn't come into existence randomly by natural forces without intelligence and then evolve themselves into these different types of cars. You have a common designer, not a common ancestor. The same thing could be true with regard to the genetic code. At the best you can say, it's a wash. The evidence for, from the genetic code could point to a common ancestor, but could also point to a common designer.